welcome everyone for this very special UCEAP Presents featuring Nell Painter. Um, I just want to go through our housekeeping slides. I already mentioned a few things. Uh, please keep your, uh, your screen or audio on mute unless uh, we are opening up for Q&A, which we will do. Uh, ask, we ask that you maybe change your name temporarily just to include your year and country of participation. participation. And if you're just a friend, that's fine as well. We're, we're happy to see you here. We will have time for Q&A at the end, but you're welcome to type uh, your question in the chat at any time. And then uh, Bryn, Vivian, and I will make sure to go through those. And we do encourage you to use your video just because it's fun. Nell doesn't have a presentation here today as far as visuals. And so it'd be great for her to see everyone's face if, you're, if you have the bandwidth that supports it. Um, we hope you enjoy the presentation. I guess I should have introduced myself first. My name is Elizabeth and uh, Janice Pearl, and I'm the alumni director here at UCEAP. And actually this month is my eight year anniversary. I just can't imagine it's gone by so quickly. I, I really enjoy my work here. Um, Bryn, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hi everyone. My name is Bryn Lemon. I'm the Scholarships and Alumni Engagement Coordinator in our office in Santa Barbara. I'm also an alumna of the program. I studied abroad in Edinburgh in 2015, worked in our offices there uh, for a year, and now I've returned and really enjoy being on this team, hosting events like this with you all today. Vivian? Hi, I'm Vivian Nitre, and I'm the Associate Vice Provost and Executive Director of UCEAP. And I was a study center director in the Netherlands twice. Uh, and, um, and actually, I have the best job in the world. <laughs> OK, so um, today we have, uh, we're so lucky to be able to um, share this event with you guys virtually. I wanted to give a little bit of a background about the event today and how it's a little bit different from our normal UCAP presents. This is our uh, Linda Dutton Haver Distinguished Alumni Award, and it was established in 2014 and named in honor of UCAP alumna Linda Dutton Haver. Linda participated in the Bordeaux program in 1975 and 76. This award is the highest honor that UCAP bestows upon an outstanding alumna or alumnus and salutes the achievement of alumni who have demonstrated a record of distinguished service and extraordinary achievement in a particular discipline or organization. The awardee will have made a positive impact on our global community and be an inspiration to current students and alumni. And we're really excited here to be presenting this award to Nell. Since 2004, Linda has supported 40 UCAP students annually with a scholarship award of $5,000 each for participation in a year long program. She's our, our best donor and uh, greatest supporter. Um, and we were happy to name this award after her. Unfortunately, Linda couldn't be with us here today, but she did send a, a, a video in her own words and why she created the Dutton Haver Scholarship Program. So let me start that for you. People often ask me about why I created my Dutton Haver Scholarship Program. To answer that, I need to first give you a little background. Peel back the calendar to 1974, when I was a sophomore at UC Santa Barbara. That fall, I rallied all of my courage to apply for a year abroad in Bordeaux, France, a logical choice for a French major. I felt emotions ranging from happiness and surprise to anxiety and fear when I learned that I had been accepted. But I got on that plane that rainy September morning and I never looked back. Now I'll confess to you that when I left for France, I didn't have much self-confidence, was rather shy and frankly scared to death of being on my own in a foreign country. Remember, this was an era before cell phones, Skype, and email. I had to figure it all out. Everything from how to get from where I lived to the university each day, to how to communicate with a doctor when I got a bad case of the flu. From buying groceries, to making a withdrawal from the bank long before the era of ATMs. But I found my way, and that year in France was one of the most memorable of my life. Being there for the entire year is what made the difference because I had enough time to really immerse myself in the experience. This couldn't have happened in a few weeks or even a few months. I went on to graduate school in international management, got married to a fellow student from that school who founded a successful international business, and I launched my career in public relations. In 2004, I joined our family's real estate business and am now managing a portfolio of industrial and commercial properties. I'm also working on some development projects. 
Thanks to the success of that business, I was able to create a charitable fund with the purpose of making a difference in the world. Okay, so now I have money to give away, but to whom, for what? I believe strongly that you need to donate money responsibly in ways that are productive and cost effective. That's when I look back at my EAP experience, which changed my life. I left for France a timid girl, afraid to step out of her comfort zone. I returned as a mature, confident woman with professional and personal skills that have served me well ever since. Self-reliance, resilience in the face of adversity, and a global view of the world, not to mention fluency in the French language. Without that experience, I'm not sure that I would have been as successful in my life, my career, and my marriage. I wanted to give that same life-changing opportunity to those who might not be as fortunate as I was, and thus the Dutton Haver Scholarships were born. The Paul Dutton Haver Extension Scholarship Form was fund, excuse me, was established in 2014 in memory of my husband, who passed away in 2011. Paul believed that international experiences lead to a richer, more interesting life and are vital to building a better understanding of our other cultures and people. Since the first scholarships were awarded in 2004, over 750 students have been given the opportunity to fulfill their dreams of studying abroad. And that gives me more joy than anything money can buy. People often ask me about why. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so as you can see, Linda is very dedicated. And um, she, in addition to taping this uh, message for you all, she also sent me some uh, quotes that students have sent her over the years. And she sent me about 20, but I picked out the top three that I thought really um, resonate as far as Linda's experience. And so I'll, again, I'll show you, she has a recording here. I'd like to leave you with a few quotes from the report students provide to me upon their return from their year abroad. These students say it more beautifully than I ever could. EAP is more than a program, more than a year in a student's life. It is a life changer, an experience that provides a lifelong foundation of confidence, self-reliance, and personal strength. I'm so proud and happy to be part of it. Thank you. So here's the first quote. I am learning so much about this country, about its people and about myself. I came with expectations to grow and learn and I am being blown away and inspired daily. Here's another one. I am not the same person that I was 10 months ago. The knowledge that I have gained of the world, the world and other cultures has changed my perspective and will forever color my thoughts, decisions and my life, my path in life. And finally, Studying abroad has completely changed my life. I am much more confident, independent, strong-willed, and adventurous. So thank you, Linda. Um, she really has been an inspiration for us over these many years that she's been working with us. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Vivian Lee, who will, uh, Vivian Lee Nyatre, who will introduce Nell for us. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. And um, Linda Dutton Haver's contributions are many. We so appreciate her and um, know that she is here with us in spirit. Um, so thank you, uh, everyone, and welcome to this delayed and different celebration of a distinguished UCEAP alumna, Nell Irvin Painter, a Professor Emerita at Princeton. Nell Painter grew up in Oakland, California, with strong family ties to education. Her mother worked in the Oakland public schools and her father was a chemist who worked at Berkeley. During the course of her own undergraduate years at Berkeley, Nell spent a year studying French medieval history at the University of Bordeaux. That year was 1962-63, making her a member of the UCEAP pioneer class, the first students in the first EAP program. Graduating in 1964 from Berkeley with an honors degree in anthropology, Nell then spent a year at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, where we now have an exchange. She then went on to earn a master's in African history at UCLA and a doctorate in American history at Harvard. There followed a long and very distinguished career as an historian of the American journey. Nell is the author of more than half a dozen acclaimed books, including Southern History Across the Color Line and the History of White People and scores of articles and presentations. She's amassed an enviable list of awards, fellowships, and honorary doctorates. Her work challenges traditional narratives of how America has come to be what it is, whose stories are worthy of being told, and of the composition and color of our citizenry. 
The faculty directory listing at Princeton notes, quote, for a full list of her publications and professional activities, see her curriculum vitae, see her CV. Well, okay, but which one? Because in addition to her award-winning work as an historian, Nell Painter has a second impressive CV as an artist. In 2009, she earned a BFA from Rutgers, and in 2011, she earned an MFA from the prestigious Rhode Island School of Design. In this second career, Nell has exhibited solo and in groups, and her work, which is both manual and digital, and I urge everyone to look back at that first slide. We can put it up at the end again and, and see her own website for examples. Um, but her work is now held in the public collection of a growing number of museums. And so it's a distinct privilege and a truly, truly great pleasure to host Professor Painter's return to one of her many homes, to the University of California and to its Education Abroad program. So please join me in welcoming historian, artist, and Linda Duttenhaver Distinguished UCEAP Alumna Award winner, Nell Irvin Painter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian Lee. Thank you. I'm really happy to be in California, even though I'm in uh, New York. Uh, thanks to Elizabeth Janice Pearl, and also to someone who's not here, Leslie Meyer Zumwalt. Um, so many, many thanks for, um, for having me and for this honor, <laughs> which is lovely. And um, while I'm showing you things, actually, this um, old in art school is uh, the, my memoir of being old in art school. And a new book that came out this year, this is the second edition of Southern History Across the Color Line. So this is the most recent one. So. Many, many thanks. Um, we've, we've been years trying to get this together and trying to, I was going to be with you in Santa Barbara in person and that didn't work out. We had a coronavirus and so on and so forth. So here I'm speaking to you from the Adirondack Mountains in uh, Northern New York. And uh, you know, it's almost 60 years that, that separate uh, this moment in 2021 from that very first education abroad year in Bordeaux in 1962, 1963. So within those 60 years, the watershed of 1968 separates my year in Bordeaux from the France of today. So 1968 really made a big difference. And I and some of those uh, of my fellow students were there in the pre-1968. And then since the pivotal year of 1968, we've had the cataclysmic year of 2020, which separates us from what California and France were in even 2019, not to mention 1968 and 1962. So I want to speak to you about how my year in Bordeaux impacted my life and my career. And I want to speak to you about what I wish I had known about Bordeaux in 1962, 1963, which I did not know because of that time and continuing today, the topic, the Algerian War for Independence from France and the people that Arki who resettled in Bordeaux remain topics that the French term non dit, things that are not to be mentioned, not to be recognized, and not to be grappled with. In 1962 and 1963, and still today, the impacts of French imperialism and the Algerian War um, are important, especially in Bordeaux. And third, I want to close by telling you how much of the um, 1962 and 1963 
was a part of the American 1950s, not the insurgent 1960s, and how you, you see EAP's leadership, local leadership, then a white professor from Alabama and UCLA, nearly derailed my future plans and bespurched my reputation with those who came immediately after me in the UC Education Abroad Program in Bordeaux. And I see that Clark Kerr is here and I have to thank him as I close my comment. So first, how my year in Bordeaux impacted my life and career. And here I wanna to read to you something that I wrote in 2012 um, in, um, a, I called it, um, the being elsewhere selection of, in a larger essay called uh, Is Essay d'Igo Histoire, and that's from an anthology called Black Women Historians in the Ivory Tower, educated by Deborah Gray White. So I started my being elsewhere section uh, in 1962. He, I started being elsewhere in 1962 with a summer in Northern Nigeria with Crossroads Africa. So I actually came to Bordeaux from Nigeria. So I had not been in the USA just before. Uh, the summer in Northern Nigeria with Crossroads Africa, uh, followed by an academic year at the University of Bordeaux was part of the University of California's first year of education abroad. I can't imagine how I would see the world, past and present, without those early experiences outside the United States, the United States with its invisible yet hyper-visible color line. I've said it before, living in a racist culture drives you crazy. It wears you out and wrecks your mind. Not that other countries are unracist, but other countries have their own forms of bigotry that don't make me the token, the target. Bordeaux afforded me the opportunity to refocus my eyes from US style racism and see things differently. In Bordeaux, I discovered I really do like history and I'm very good at it. I studied French medieval history there, one of the fields in my general exams at Harvard years later. I just loved the study of history. If I hadn't been born Black when I was, I probably would have been a historian of medieval France. So that comes from my essay, Egoiste Well. In Bordeaux, I lived with another UC student, and it may or may not matter that she was Jewish. Uh, at the edge of the city, as it was then, on a street called Cour Marnou, which was named for a local resistance during the Second World War. And that name, which no longer exists, is one indication of how very close the war was in 1962 in France. Now, I, I grew up in Oakland uh, and the war was not close. The Second World War was ancient history. It seemed like something from an earlier era and for other far off places like East Asia and Europe. But in Bordeaux, in France in 1962, France was still very poor. Women would painstakingly repair the runs in their stockings. And for me to knit me a sweater charging a pittance for the labor. German bunkers still stood on the Atlantic coast. So in Bordeaux in that year, I learned a new kind of chronology in which something that had occurred a decade and a half previously was still part of everyday life. In 1962, 1963, the University of Bordeaux was still in the middle of town. And as I walked to it, I passed the Hotel de Ville and the Cathedral wondering about how they got there and when and why, what they meant. Those questions freed me to think historically. 
I was no longer oppressed by the lies and omissions of the US history I had been taught in school and which I knew was a lie. I grew up in an academic family and I read W.E.B. Du Bois and John Hope Franklin at home. I was aware of the civil rights struggles against segregation and disfranchisement occurring in the South in the 1950s and 1960s. But for me then, then being 1962, 1963, the history of France held no such snarls. I studied French medieval history, was good at it, loved it. And so began my life as a historian. Two, what I wish I had known about Bordeaux in 1962, 1963, but did not, because at that time and continuing until today, that topic, the Algerian war and the people who waged it was a non dit. If I had known, I would have asked my fellow students from Algeria, and I knew at least one about his and his parents' experiences. That would have led me to a very changed discussion that would have resonated with what I knew of events in history in the USA. But the non dit remained unsaid, and I missed out on knowledge that would have enriched my understanding of France and the issues that continue to resound today. And uh, I should add, um, uh, Vivian Lee mentioned uh, my book, The History of White People, which in 2019 uh, came out in a French edition. And I did two book tours in early 2019 which told me how different France was now uh, from the France that I knew in the 60s and even the France I knew as my husband and I returned years later. So um, if I had known about the role that Bordeaux played uh, in the Algerian war, I think it would have enriched the conversation I could have had in 2019. Well, it did because in 2019, I did know um, bringing the history of the USA and the history of France somewhat closer together in terms of dealing with the different segments of the society, different uh, populations within the society. So, um, but the non dit remained unsaid, and I missed out on knowledge that would have enriched my understanding of France and the issues that continue to resound today. And finally, how much of the 1962-1963 France and US was a part of the American 1950s? You may think of 1962-1963 as part of the revolutionary 1960s, as encapsulated in the free street speech movement, the civil rights movement, and the anti-war sentiment of the revolutionary year of 1968. 1968 was a revolutionary year in France as well as the USA. And the France that you encounter today is more like the France of 1969 than 1962. My 1962-1963 France was post-war and pre-1968. That was France. My UCEAP was the 1950s USA, a USA in which a crowd of 50 or even a thousand in an auditorium in Donnell Hall could be all white and unremarkable for being all white. How many times at the University of California was I the sole black person in a sea of white people, countless times. All whiteness in those days was perfectly normal, even proper. And for the Alabamian head of UCEAP from UCLA, my presence in Bordeaux was not only to be discouraged, but hindered. He interfered with my grades in a way that only my honors before and after Bordeaux could become and with the help of then President Clark Kerr. 
he told he not Clark Kerr the uh, the then head who is was deceased shortly afterwards told the black student who followed me in Bordeaux what a terrible person I was which she had no way of countering until we met decades later. My other grades and letters of recommendation made possible my acceptance into Harvard Graduate School. But it's worth my mentioning today to remind you that California in 1962-1963 was a part of the United States at that time in which segregation, discrimination, and exclusion were normal. It's taken a long time to move American society away from the mores of the 1950s and 1960s. The events of 2020, the second watershed I mentioned, the massive outpouring of a diverse array of hundreds of thousands of Americans to protest the murder of George Floyd and others, the support for Black Lives Matter and the denunciation of white supremacy have fundamentally changed the discourse and, I'm hopeful, the reality of a multiracial, multicultural American democracy. Thanks. Thank you, Nell. It's wonderful. Um, I really appreciate your comments and I can't imagine what it would have been like to be there. Do we, I don't think that we have any questions yet in chat, but we also, um, Vivian, do, do we want to have people raise their hands maybe and we can ask them to speak directly to Nell? Um, or did you want to lead some questions? Um, well, um, I think, well, I, I was going to say, I think there's a question, but it's just applause. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved, well deserved. But I actually um, did have a question, if you, if you don't mind to sort of start yeah. things off. Um, I noticed in your art CV, um, and I do recommend that people go and look at both. It's it's extraordinary. But you talk about 2020, uh, you know, as the year of great upheaval. And I wonder if coming out of that year, you know, do you look at at both of your, you know, kind of parallel careers differently? And if so, how? Yeah, um, 2020 changed my art, actually. Um, I began addressing uh, what was going on around me politically and socially directly in a way I hadn't before. I made three pieces of art. Um, I make artist books uh, in 2020 and two of the three were, um, were related to the society. The first one, um, which you can see all this on my website, the first one, uh, came out of the history of white people, uh, which was published in 2010, which is before Trump. So I needed to address American whiteness since Trump. So it's called American whiteness since Trump. Uh, so that has uh, 28 pages, I think. It's on the James Fuentes Gallery uh, online website. So that I made in Italy in February and March. Uh, I was at the Boliasco Foundation. Uh, my husband was with me. We got out of Genoa in March, March 13th, wow. which was the last flight out of Genoa to anywhere. Amazing. And we came directly up here to the Adirondacks. Um, so that was the first one. The second one, which I made after Juneteenth, after George Floyd, and it's called From Slavery to Freedom. And it addresses the questions of the murders, of the, you know, the continuing decades long murders of black Americans, the uh, upheaval, uh, the demonstrations. We had demonstrations up here in the Adirondack North Country. My husband and I were in two, um, one in Keene Keene Valley, and one which was uh, 500 people in Saranac Lake. So uh, we felt this as a, as a national outpouring in, in a very uh, direct way. So uh, this From Slavery to Freedom uh, addresses the demonstrations, 
but also the dismantling of, of the Confederate um, commemorations. Mm -hmm. And it, it ends with the words of Lift Every Voice and Sing, which I grew up with as the Negro National Anthem, now called the Black National Anthem, and which I wish were the National Anthem, because it ends by, um, first of all, it recognizes the difficult times we have been through, meaning we Americans, as well as we Black Americans, and um, wants us to be true to our native land in a hopeful way. Mm -hmm. So those were the two that dealt with the issues of the time. The third piece I said, uh, I made actually, was just a sort of cri de coeur about being away from home in Newark, New Jersey. My home in Newark, New Jersey for all these months, and I just missed my friend, Adrian. So it only has um, three images and text, and it's called I knit socks for Adrian. So that's how 2020 changed my art. I came out as a knitter at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in, uh, in, in where we are, we actually have a group called the Santa Barbara Craftivists. And I was delighted to learn that they actually were making hats for all of the people who stood in line last in November to yeah. vote in the cold in Minnesota. Wonderful. So yeah. the, we all, I think, you know, we're trying to come together in many ways uh, across the country. There is a question from um, a member of the, of the group. Um, it's from Michael, who was in Bordeaux in 1968-69. And he's wondering uh, whether the Algerian war was discussed at all by French students when you were there. No, it was a non dit. Mm -hmm. It really was. And when I talked about it uh, in my book tour in uh, 2019, people assured me it is still a non dit. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I would love to hear from my um, my colleagues uh, from 1962. I know we have a number on here. Does anyone want to start? <laughs> I see Skip and Dennis. Pat. Oh, Skip. Skip's raising his hand. Hi, Skip. I remember walking down the street in Bordeaux with two French students and who were berating me about the racial conditions in America because there had just been news that, that was ugly. And in the middle of this conversation, one of them said, but il faut traverser la rue parce qu'il y a we have to cross the street because there are Arabs coming. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was around us. We were also told, I think Nell will remember, we were also warned not to go near Mer the Mariadec, which now is this huge shopping center. Yeah. Um, and it was, a, a, and we used to go there because they, that was the place that showed good movies instead of the <laughs> Hollywood ones yeah. that were out on the Cours de l'Intendance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But we, we would have to sneak over there because we were yeah. actually formally told not to go around there because it was full of Arabs by the okay. University of California. I remember, <laughs> this is Dennis. Um, I remember in 62, 63, we had a choice of three dining halls where the students could go and eat. And there was one that I don't think many in our group went to, but it was somewhere in the poor middle part of town. I, I don't remember the exact street, but I would go there not, it wasn't my primary place of taking my meals, but I would go there periodically and there were a lot of Arab students there. Mm -hmm. And there, there was always an element of tension in the, in the dining hall and also of kind of uh, protest and manifestation. It was, it was one of the places where you know we, we had these metal bowls and dishes and stuff, and they would uh, there would be issues that they would be banging on the bowls and making a protest. <laughs> and you know I, I had very mixed feelings about going there. There was a sense of unease because of the old atmosphere, and um, but even though I would go there quite frequently and and have discussions with people, we never talked about the situation in, in Algeria. 
even though there were a lot of Algerian students here. And it, and it was a loss. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. Pat, hi. <laughs> Nell, it's so wonderful to see you. I was Pat O'Mara. Uh, ah. And as I remember, we travel together sometimes. I have a lot of warm memories my, of my time with you. So it's incredibly wonderful to see you and appreciate your books, appreciate your art. Great going. Great oh, going. thank you, Pat. How good to see you. <laughs> wonderful to see you. Linda or Anne, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? Um, I'm unmuted, but I can't <laughs> seem to get my video going. This is Ann Colmus. And Nell, it's so good to see you. I remember many times together also. And the one thing I truly agree with you with is that it truly was a post-war year. Little did we realize how much the influences um, were affecting us. Yeah. back then in 62. So thanks for all your comments and it's so good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Yeah, I'm uh, Linda Steele and uh, we did, you know, I don't think we were real close in Bordeaux, but I had immediately, you know, recognized your name and, and uh, when I got the email about this, uh, this talk. So it's, it's very fun to, uh, to see you. And, and, and I didn't realize I could put, or I should have put, you know, my years in Bordeaux on my, uh, um, when I signed in. But it's, it's really fun to see the faces who did. Yeah. And there's some, there are some who are not on video, like June Gill <laughs> and Judy. I think I know which Judy it is, um, who are, you know, on, on other, uh, uh, no picture at this point. But there were you. there were eighty of you that year, so it was a big cohort. It was a big so group. I, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Um, you raised your hand, but I don't know your name. It has numbers. Um, I think you it's talk? The, the question yeah. about the quality okay. of the professors at Bordeaux in that year is that the question? Oh. Yep. Yes. The the French professors or. The French professors? Yes. Yeah. Um, they were fine with me. <laughs> no, I had no <laughs> way of making a comparison, but I do remember um, the uh, medieval history was uh, on the Guerre de Cent Ans and uh, Bertrand du Guesclin. Uh, I learned a lot about war and about warlords and about gangs. And I took that actually into my dissertation. Um, but uh, something else I also remember uh, was that the students would cry out, Comment ça s'écrit? Comment ça s'écrit? How do you spell that? How do you spell that? <laughs> they said that out loud. And I had a problem. The, the uh, teacher said, if ever you Californians have any questions, you can come and, and ask me. So I came and I said, I don't understand what is Doitois. What is Doitois? It turns out it was Edouard Troy, who was the king of France at the time. Um, so my memories of the, the teaching, uh, the French teaching are, are perfectly fine. And I learned so much that was not tainted by American exclusions or distortions on account of racism in our history. There is another question from um, an alum who went to Bordeaux uh, a few years after. It's Marty, who was there from 72 to 73. And um, you know, he's asking whether you would recommend studying abroad today to American students of color. Oh, absolutely. And you could go anywhere. You could go to a country in Central Africa. You could go to a country in Northern Europe. You could go to a country in South Asia. You could go to a country in Latin America. It doesn't matter where you go, just go, <laughs> just go. 
um, I told you that I called this that section in my Ego Histoire uh, being elsewhere. And I cannot recommend highly enough being elsewhere. Uh, Skip, is your hand up anew or is that from before? Oh, no, it's anew. I just wanted to mention that on what Nell was saying that um, we also, for professors, we also had Jacques Ellul, who of course was a, a, a widely known, I don't know, Nell, I sent you a picture of the street named after him. I don't know if you, I emailed it to you. I don't know if you got uh, it. I, um, I can't get to email at the moment, right. Uh, this was a few months ago, but oh. they have actually named a street after him near the, over near the, near the uh, train station. Mm -hmm. And he, he went out of his way. He had us to his home, uh, was in addition to being a world famous right. uh, uh, historian and, and anthropologist, yeah. Yeah. he was, he was a, a, a wonderful man. And of course we had right. you know, Mr. Garcia, who's already been discussed, you know, right. Saint, yes. Saint Louis, we used to call him. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, about uh, being invited to homes and things like that, I think that Alabamian I mentioned made sure that I was cut out of a lot of things. I am so sorry to hear that, Nell, and I see Elaine Backrack has her hand up, but I do want to say one thing for everyone's benefit, and that is that, you know, I think UCEAP is itself a very different organization than it was. It has been trying to evolve. And yeah. one of the things that we began doing, and unfortunately were cut off because of the pandemic, was to have training for our staff abroad. Um, to help them understand differences in terms of the experiences of our students. As you experience, you go a, a, a abroad with a group, but everyone experiences it differently. And students from particular communities are subjected to treatment that is, um, you know, can be quite hurtful and damaging. And yeah. so we've been embarking with uh, an organization called Diversity Abroad to try to offer training for our staff abroad so that they are aware and can be supportive in the ways that are needed. Yeah, what I wanted to do was point out that uh, the early 60s really were like the 50s yeah. and that California was not exempt. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Elaine? Oh, you're muted. Um, okay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, Nell. Oh, it's hi, Elaine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's Elaine Horowitz. It's really nice listening to you. And I have to apologize because I was at a hospital appointment and I missed the first half of what you were saying. And what I'm really interested in knowing is, did you mention the American consul in Bordeaux? No. Okay. So because to me, that was one of my salient memories of the entire year is that he was totally bigoted. And I don't know if you went to the gathering at, at his home, but he, if you were there, you would have felt most unwelcome, I'm sure. Because well, I was not there, there. I can tell you <laughs> that. Okay, and I missed also who you said you felt um, was responsible for your being excluded from things. I remember it as the professor from UCLA, that is a Californian, who uh -huh. fell from oh, Alabama. You I know, this see. is a long time ago. Maybe I'm confusing the consul, but I'm, as I remember it, he was staff from the University of California. Interesting. Well, yeah. because uh, of the entire year, I remember this evening at the home of the American consul. He was himself a Southerner. And um, I totally can relate to what you're saying about 62 being a post-war year as yeah. opposed to a post-liberation of anything yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I think in retrospect, I'm happy you were not there because it would have colored even more your yeah. experience. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. of us, I, I know that coming from California, in those days, and from an experience I've had in New York already in the late 50s, that we didn't know what to expect in terms of um, racial divisions in the country. We were really, we were innocents abroad. Yeah. And 
Um, I, I remember going home from that evening being so shocked that this could be the face of America in Europe. And how, how did we justify this? And knowing my hands were tied, didn't know what to say. We were guests also, but it was really very shocking to me. If I would encounter something similar today, um, elsewhere in the world, I would be in such, such protest against my government. I mean, if I didn't already have a hundred other reasons to be in protest, <laughs> that alone would have been shocking. And um, so I, I find it really very interesting. Also uh, wondered if there are people on who had similar experiences of going to the United States Army base um, and have recollections of that. I remember going for Thanksgiving and celebrating it uh, at the Army base there. And of course, there, there is no U.S. Army base there today, but um, I'm wondering if other people remember that. I, I remember that the highlight was being able to go to the PX and buy all the things that we couldn't get in Europe. No. So, um, and, and sitting through a Thanksgiving service that simply represented a different America than the consul's house represented. Mm. Very different. Anyway, I thank you for your presentation. I was looking forward to the, the gathering in person that was supposed to happen. Yeah. But um, I, I did catch your book a few years ago, the one about uh, the history of white people. And um, I, your success speaks well for you and speaks well for all of us too. So I'm really quite proud. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Clark, did you want to say something? Yeah. Hi. How are you? Um, I was, uh, I'm not the year 62, 63. We were the second uh, 63, 64 group. So not quite the pioneers, but the almost pioneers. I wanted to mention a couple of things. I was never out in the, um, at the U.S. Army base of the PX. To be honest with you, I must have been with the out group because I'm not even sure I remember that that existed there. Uh, I was out in Talence, which was uh, out in the uh, sort of hinterlands uh, of Bordeaux, now completely a suburb part. Um, I used to eat in that restaurant in the center part of town. Uh, and I actually uh, spent much time with the Senegalese students, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of fun and learned quite a bit, which probably did a ended up helping me go to the Peace Corps for three years, uh, a couple of years later, I served in Niger. And that was possible because I was able to speak French. Sure. Uh, so that was kind of fun. I did not meet the Algerian students. I did have a good time with the uh, Senegalese students. And I was actually there eating with the students the night that Kennedy was, it was night in France, the night mm -hmm. that Kennedy was assassinated. And it was the Senegalese students who informed me that Kennedy had been assassinated and, and sort of helped me get over my immediate shock and grief at that time. Uh, Neil, you mentioned that um, in that period of time, Bordeaux was very different than it is now. I mean, Bordeaux was completely, it's, it, the, it was a kind of a gray city. The, the soot from hundreds of years was all over the buildings. Uh, the weather was kind of dark. It was kind of, you know, you, you needed your headlights on a lot of the time. Now it's completely cleaned up. It's, it's, a, it's a very fun place in many ways. But it was very much still tied in with World War II. And as, as you remember, many of us, or maybe all of us were assigned or were working. We had a, a French family that would take us in and talk to us and do things with us. And Mike Abkin, who was from UCLA, I was at Davis at the time, from UCLA, he and I were sort of adopted by a young French couple. They were probably about 30 years old, a little older than us, but maybe just a decade. And the woman, Christine, told us a story uh, during World War II, when she was walking home as a elementary school student, I guess maybe first, second grade, and just to show the horror that was still uh, among the French at that time, she had been with a half dozen kids. Apparently the resistance had assassinated a few German soldiers the night before. Mm. And so this little group was coming back and they didn't know at the time that had happened. And the German soldiers took the group and they lined them up against a wall. They pulled this woman, Christine, out. She's, she was a very beautiful woman and she was blonde. She was the only beautiful Aryan, quote, blonde. 
They pulled her aside. They lined up all her friends against the wall and shot them dead. And so that, and she was in tears as she told us that story. So that, as, as you mentioned, Nell, for us, World War II was, it was ancient history. But for the French then and there, it was very much part of their day. Absolutely. So it was a, it was a, it was a, a wonderful experience, but it was also a kind of a sobering experience because it brought a period of time that was a very difficult in everybody's history, very much to life, which I had not experienced in the United yeah. States. Thank you. There's a question in chat from uh, Fadi from Davis, and I agree, I have a very similar question. Um, did you paint before, uh, and was that the motivation to pursuing your BFA and MFA? Oh, no, um, I grew up drawing. My father taught me to draw, my mother taught me to read and write. Uh, so I did those from a tiny tot. Um, I actually got a C in sculpture at Berkeley, <laughs> which made me think I didn't have enough talent. The question actually was not about talent. It was about applying yourself and doing the work. Um, and I thought that if you had sufficient talent, you didn't have to do any work. Um, so that was the end of my um, art career as an undergraduate at Berkeley. Um, but I, I wrote a biography of the abolitionist Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth did not read and write. So everything we know about her in words comes from other people, including the slogan associated with her, which I will not utter. Um, which was made up 12 years after supposedly she said it, uh, made up by a white woman journalist um, who was in competition with, um, with um, oh dear, with <laughs> Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, so Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet oh. Beecher Stowe, yeah. So um, I had to find a means uh, into uh, Sojourner Truth's concept of herself. She had her photographs taken and she sat for photographs. She uh, controlled how the photographs would be set up, how, what she would wear, all of that, she controlled it. And so I ended up writing a chapter called Truth in Photographs and I gave myself, um, um, a kind of visual education. Luckily, um, I had, I was at Princeton still, and I had access to a magnificent art history library, so I could do that. And I actually fell in love with first the rhetoric of the image, and then the actual making of images. So over the course of a few years, I tried out actually drawing and painting and discovered Boy. I enjoyed it, but that I could stand up and draw and paint in New York City in an unair conditioned studio mm -hmm. from uh, nine in the morning until six at night and stay over for crits. So that's how I got into it. <laughs> Let's see. I think there's a comment from, um, is that Amir? Uh, any difference or contrast between France and the USA even today in terms of overt versus covert racist attitudes and topics of discussions? Yeah, big question. This came to me all the time when I was on book tour. Um, and I, I think I said before that the conversation in France about we, what we in the United States call race uh, is different, still different. It was very, it did not exist um, in 1962. And it uh, would be even more the same since 2020. In 2019, it was more like what we recognize in the United States. So um, one big difference is that, that France has an over imperialist colonialist heritage. France has um, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Réunion uh, that are overseas département. So they're part of France. Yet when the people come to uh, metropolitan France, they can be racialized and uh, dealt with as if they're foreigners. 
but they're not foreigners. So, uh, and then there's the whole question of the Syrians and of Islam. So the question of Islam is much more pronounced in the United States, uh, more pronounced in France than the United States because the Muslim population is much larger than in the United States. So there, there are significant differences. There's a significantly different history, but there is much that converges now. And I think what has gone on in the United States holds lessons that um, the people who make decisions in France and live their lives could do well to heed. Interesting. I think we still have one hand up. Did you, um, hi, did you want to say something again? Oh. I, I think it may just have been remained okay. up. Okay. Okay. Any other I, questions? Oh, go ahead. Hi, Neil. This is Alfonso from Mexico City. Oh, hello. So wonderful to see you, Neil. Thank mm -hmm. you. Senor Ebisu. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, in Newark, I live in um, a Hispanic neighborhood, uh, the Ironbound. And actually, it's not exactly Hispanic because one of the basic languages is Portuguese. But, but it's very much uh, a neighborhood that um, sees itself and talks to itself in Spanish and Portuguese and in other languages besides English. Yeah, good to see you. Such wonderful memories. <laughs> Such wonderful memories. I strongly recommend that uh, students today also take a year abroad. Absolutely. Very, very, very useful. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, I think I we're think, just at our time. Yeah. I was going to say, any last questions? I think. Um, I don't see anything popping up. Well, thank you so much, Nell. I don't know if you have an extra few minutes. Maybe your your cohort from 62 can stay on the call and you guys that can do would all be lovely. a quick hello um, and without uh, all of us listening in. Um, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you being with us today and look forward thank to the day when we can be together. Um, we've always, Vivian and I have talked about doing an event on the East Coast for many years. And so okay. we'd like to come out there and, and, and meet in person. And um, we look forward to that day. But thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your experiences from 1962. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Marty, you have your hand up again.